All right. Thanks for joining me, everyone. This is the Chapter 6 film lecture video over motion picture and cinematography. Let's dive right into it. I wanted to start with something that was the reason why I really stopped and looked at how powerful and how much cultural value that film can bring to our society and to our culture, even through an older film like Rocky II, in this iconic scene from Rocky's run, you can see the elements of what is known as the montage. And you can also formulate ideas about the character and the overall narrative of the underdog. So I'm going to play this for a moment. Hope you enjoy. Now, as you can tell in this scene with Rocky, you have the combination of the content and the form. Form and content is what makes up a film. And so when you think about form, it's not necessarily about what's in the film, it's how it's made. So we're looking at shot selection, we're looking at sound, we're looking at all of the elements that would make up the film design, that's the form. The content itself is what makes up the narrative, the actor choice, the, the script itself. So it's the content, it's the substance within, and the form is the package. So what's really cool about this particular lecture is that we're only gonna focus on a few things, and those are listed here today, such as a short history of the film industry, we're also going to think about and describe the cultural value of films and what the implications are to film today. And it's something that we call the blockbuster mentality. We'll also look at some of the components of the industry, such as production and distribution, and then look at the convergence effect in film and how the digital technology has shaped and reshaped the film industry. So just a brief history, there is a, there's a bet that's taken place between a governor of California and in particular, they hire Edward Moybridge, which is a British photographer. And this is back in 1877. And this is the invention of essentially motion picture. We have 24 still cameras that are set up along a track using a tripwire uh, setup. 
And this is the birth of 24 frames per second. So if you're a fan of A24, that's where the name comes from, is the birth of motion picture using still cameras. Projected images are, are used in this particular matter to settle a bet. And basically the, uh, the question was, does a horse come up on its four hind legs all at once? And obviously the answer is yes. And that's really the way we get to understand how film really was uh, important. And it, essentially it helped to settle a bet, but it also uh, sparked the innovation to pursue cameras that would actually work quickly enough to give us what we know today as motion picture. So this development was kind of slow coming, but there was a zoetrope that they used to display the images of the horse. It was made up of a cylinder with slits, just like you see here, and a row of images on the inside of the cylinder helped to spin the, the pictures fast enough to give you images in motion and in sequence. It kind of relates to the 1980s Viewmaster. So if you had a toy like this or maybe a comic book uh, strip book that you could flip, same concept. It also maintained a pretty mechanical uh, projection system where you had a what's called a Zoe Praxiscope as one of the first early images or first early devices to display a moving image. And so it's one thing to capture the motion, but it's also another thing to display it. So this helped to uh, allow Edward Moybridge to conceive his photographic pioneer um, uh, era in developing the motion picture industry. So it was considered an important part in where we see our film industry today. Some other devices were the invention of the kinetoscope by the Thomas Edison lab, but it was only designed for individual viewing, not a communal thing, but it was intended for uh, very short films to be displayed and demonstrated publicly in what we know as the nickel arcades or a Nickelodeon theater. This was the time period between 1905 and 15 where people would go in and pay five cents to watch a film in a kinetoscope, which was roughly about 12 minutes. And it was a popular form of entertainment because it preceded the radio and the television. Now, this is a French term known as the cinematographe, and this is where we get the term cinematography, which is sort of the art behind the film uh, direction and the shot selection and the sound integration and sort of evoking that emotion. And this was first invented by Augustine and Louis Lemire, who were from France. And they invented a device that photographed and projected these moving images. And it was sort of a continuation of the innovation that we were seeing with the projection of motion picture. So the two developed uh, the film industry in France and started to show their films in the traditional theater setting. So a lot of the films really look like plays. Um, there was a, a set camera, didn't really move too much. And this was the first film that er was ever made in history. And you can also see the reaction from folks when the train is coming um, to them. And this is called the arrival of the train. So as you can see there, the train arrival was pretty iconic. It was something new for folks. And as we look back at the powerful effects era, this essentially was what helped to characterize mass communication as a powerful tool, as a powerful medium, because people really thought that this train was coming out of the screen. All right, so moving on into the silent film era, as you saw, this film didn't have any particular sounds until uh, later on with the development of, of sound recording technology. And so this is just a, an image here of something that's been dug up and it's known as the blacksmith scene. It, as you can see here, it's a pretty short film.
All right. And so in addition to that, you also have the Great Train Robbery film, which is the first uh, to use editing, intercutting of scenes. And this is Edwin Porter's work, who was actually working within uh, and underneath Thomas Edison in the Thomas Edison lab. And he was the first to create this idea of a montage where you tie together two separate but related shots. And it takes on a new sort of unified meaning like you saw in the Rocky film. Um, so this was pretty iconic. It was one of the first Western films to be used. Uh, I will send you these slides so that way you can see this in full length if you desire. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on for the sake of time here. All right. And so moving further into the beginning part of the 19, uh, 1900s, you have the birth of the blockbuster film. And this is the first feature length film that is uh, produced and uh, known as the Birth of a Nation, and it was directed by D.W. Griffith. And uh, this particular film was pretty problematic. It was showing uh, African Americans arriving to uh, America and uh, the Ku Klux Klan in a particular way that was deemed by many as a sort of a racist film. Um, during its time, it was uh, uh, quote unquote uh, seen as, as as sort of a story tell that was potentially um, in this era pretty normal. Um, and it's, it's sad to say that, but that was particularly the, 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 the norm. There was a cultural uh, context that this was displayed in during the, the era of Jim Crow. Um, so this was the first feature linked film. Um, movie stars were not necessarily given credit on screen because studios were quite reluctant to do that, given that they thought actors would, um, you know, ask for more money if they were given screen credit and outside financing became a huge deal for bigger budgets, uh, bigger films. And so in this uh, era here, in the blockbuster film era, you started to see new financing options come available, particularly for um, those that were doing quite well in the acting scene, which we'll talk about here in a second. So the big studios at the time were all operating in Manhattan in the New York area. And... What was important here to understand is that um, Thomas Edison was a huge innovator. He had a lot of power and he actually had a lot of patents on particular cameras that were being invented at the time. And so he had an opportunity to gather 10 uh, studio companies and they created this sort of partnership known as the MPPC. And it stands for the Motion Picture Patents Company. And it was known as a, the trust. They were known as the gatekeepers. So if you wanted to make a film, they held all the patents for the new innovation, the, in the new innovative cameras um, and all existing film equipment that uh, existed in order to make a film. So they made rules also about the way movies should look and how they should be formatted. Um, they should be formatted to be 12 minutes long um, and they should adopt a stage sort of setting here um, and a stage perspective, kind of similar to what you was seen in uh, in theaters, um, in live action theaters. So, needless to say, they were um, those that uh, they were kind of, you know, monopolizing the uh, the industry, uh, creating all these you know unnecessary rules, and so it, it made it hard for independent uh, filmmakers to uh, penetrate. And so they migrated west to Hollywood during this time frame a lot of money, um, you know, more, you know, people were moving and migrating to the West due to the gold rush. Um, in addition to that, you had better weather, you had longer days, and they could even avoid the motion picture patent uh, groups, sanctions and rules. Um, so it gave them a little bit more, more creative freedom um, when they moved out West. And that's sort of a short history of why we have Hollywood uh, today. So, in the 1920s and 30s, you also it also gave rise to um, well uh, to do and successful actors in the film industry, and they acted in rebellion against big studios by way of creating their own financing for their own films and for new stories to be told. So that made up Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, Mary Pinkford. They all created the United Artists. A consortium and a group of people who were acquiring and distributing independent films 
to challenge sort of the mainstream type of films that were being created at the time. And so they became an independent source for financing of, of other small films. So this is sort of the hidden history behind Charlie Chaplin that we don't know. In addition to that, obviously, you see the growth of big Hollywood studios coming in. Uh, and these are the ones, obviously, we know of today as the dominant media conglomerates who tell a lot of our stories in film. So major film studios uh, during this era of growth in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they actually employed the writers, actors, directors, uh, editors, and they, they contracted them on weekly salaries. Whereas today, most of the editors or post-production folks or even pre-production folks um, are part of a writer's guild. Um, you have actors known as the actor's guild. And so they work off contract. So they don't necessarily work for a film studio today, but rather they work as freelancers or they're part of a union. So this is how it worked in the beginning as sort of pushing out as many films that they could possibly do uh, via assembly line fashion, kind of similar to what you would see and study in the automo automobile industry at the time with Ford uh, coming in in the 1930s to uh, change the way people transported themselves via a vehicle, right? So it was more of a factory type studio um, that had a sort of a mass production process. Today, it doesn't work necessarily work that way. But studios at the time had also uh, complete control over the distribution of films. There was something known as block booking, which is theater owners were required to book a whole series of the movies from the studio in order to get that one blockbuster hit. There was also this double feature with a B movie um, where, you know, if MGM made a, a, a big hit movie, uh, lots of action or a lot of, a lot of money involved, um, but they also made some smaller films. Um, they required the studios to take both of them. And it's not too different than what you see today as a business model uh, for theaters. But the idea now is, you know, in the 1940s, with all of this control of creation and distribution, the U.S. Supreme Court actually had to step in. In late 1938, Paramount was actually charged with conspiring to set specific terms for movie theaters, sort of bullying them in the process uh, with these block bookings. And it sort of kept independent films out of theaters that they themselves owned. So think about that. If they're not part of the group, your story doesn't get told. Um, so in 1948, the U.S. Supreme Court um, ruled that the studios themselves including Paramount, had to sell their movie theaters. And that's what made the theater companies separate from the film studios. And that's still the model today. However, um, the end of vertical integration uh, is not over. It's not the end. Because of streaming now, These you could argue that these big uh, major media conglomerates like Disney not only own the process of creating a film, such as Disney Studios, but they can also, after putting it in the theater for 30 to 45 days, take it back and put it on their own platform for it to continue to create revenue, right? So there's, there's, there's kind of a, a back and forth here, and it almost feels like, you know, um, we're, we're back where we started. So film studios have a lot of power, um, have had a lot of power, but there's also been this political uh, struggle, right? Films have a lot of cultural value. And so politicians realize that and they have a lot of persuasive power. So in the 1950s, 10 Hollywood um, film creators, uh, directors were brought in uh, or it's, Congress attempted to bring them in and ask them to answer questions in, in a House Un-American committee, which you know, sometimes will see like on C-SPAN and they'll have hearings about social media today. Well, back then, the concern was, are films going to be made and are they going to be sympathetic to uh, Soviet Russia, which at the time, obviously still um, thinking about the Cold War, was a communist uh, state. So these 10 Hollywood workers were actually blacklisted for not showing up to the uh, hearing, were held in contempt, were actually brought in and... Uh, and, and place under arrest, but eventually were let go. However, once this whole saga was over, 
they were blacklisted and it was difficult for them to get continued work in the industry um, due to their scarred reputation. So that is kind of known as the Red Scare in Hollywood. Now in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, there's something what is it's known as soft power for a film. When you think about how much persuasive power it does have, these are narratives. These are stories about ideas. And one particular example was during the Cold War era. And you can obviously go back and study these films that were released during the time um, to indicate that, you know, America was sort of portrayed as the good um, country, right? Freedom, independence versus uh, a Soviet state like Russia was seen in a, in a sort of negative light, right? And so you have Rocky IV, which is, you know, taking control of that narrative and exemplifying those types of ideas. And so Hollywood has a lot of power in distributing what is known as the soft power because they see the films as cultural products. And I would argue that we ourselves should see them as pretty powerful because they do help to shape our ideas, our values, and our identity. So that's just a little bit of, of what soft power is, and we'll talk more about that as we go throughout this course of the semester. Now, film is also art, and we should appreciate it. So I wanted to share this little quick clip of The Shining in 1980, which really takes hold of a new uh, technique in horror film, or in this case, thriller and horror, um, which helps to emphasize the sound, the way that the cuts are, the editing. And it's just uh, phenomenal because it's obviously something that inspired horror films today. All right. So as you can see there, pretty phenomenal stuff, uh, pretty innovative stuff at the time that was uh, in order to help create that narrative and that thriller effect. So our film industry today can be characterized by the blockbuster era, a continued era of huge films, huge budgets. And one of the first to be considered a blockbuster film was Jaws. And it also helped to create a new type of movie theater, which is known as the multiplex cinema, going all the way into the early 2000s when many movie theaters were built with 24 screens alone. So that was pretty big. Now we're kind of on the, um, on, on the other end of things where movie theaters are, are starting to uh, regress in size. And uh, you can see that here. Uh, by looking at your local movie theaters and, you know, for the most part, seeing that they maybe have scaled back on the number of screens that they have and incorporating other aspects to entertainment like bowling alleys and things like that. So the industry is changing. There is the, the, the production process has definitely changed because of convergence. Uh, we have what's now known as cloud computing, which you might not realize has an, uh, an immediate effect on the film industry because it can help to moderate the production costs by shooting a film on site with a crew. And then everyone disperses 
we upload the footage and editors across the country who are freelancers who are hired for this project can actually work from home or not be on set. Whereas before in the factory studio process in the early 30s, 40s and 50s, you had to sort of be on site and work for the film studio uh, themselves. So things have really changed. Editors, animators can definitely work remotely because of this new convergence in technology. And it frees up filmmakers from um, sort of the financial technical limitations. Additional change that's happened, of course, is through the form. Now, many films uh, can arguably still be made on actual film versus uh, what we're seeing is it obviously is a shift in in um, in high definition cameras. So there's also known, uh, George Lucas is also known for the computer controlled camera and using it first in Attack of the Clones part two. Now you can definitely watch this in the slideshow, but for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and move forward there. Also digital filmmaking has had an impact through computer generated imagery or what is known as CGI. So the grand special effects you can still create without having an actual set to go to or location. So it does increase production costs. However, the, the return on investment is pretty good, especially with Avatar getting more than 300 million in the box office. Um, and knowing, knowing now it is the number one most uh, profitable film in the world. And then Avengers Endgame as well. And if you're thinking, what was the first movie to be filmed in full CGI? And that was none other than 300. So feel free to enjoy that on your own time there. I'm going to move us forward here. Just for the sake of time. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, little lesson here about how things are changing in the film industry because of convergence how it's got a cultural impact on our society and really can be something that shapes and forms and maintains our culture and our identity. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching.